Welcome to Education Matters, brought to you by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Mary Ann Wolfe. In last week's episode, we were able to discuss the need for ongoing STEM investments and exposure to high quality STEM content as early as kindergarten. These discussions bring awareness to the need for collective strategies and intentional collaboration and partnerships within the STEM pipeline. The goal is to ensure that every child has access to high quality STEM during school and out of school time. As we continue these conversations, we will engage educators and program providers and amplify the voices of youth and young adults. On today's show, we will discuss with a K-12 STEM educator and a program provider how they are preparing youth to enter a dynamic and ever-changing workforce. At the end of the show, we will hear from youth and young adult participants who have benefited from high-quality STEM engagement opportunities. Each voice expressed today holds a unique perspective of STEM in North Carolina. Joining us now are Jose Garcia, the STEM Education Director of Green County Schools, and Alvin Powell, President of the Inner Banks STEM Center. As the world experiences the COVID-19 pandemic, and it seems to be continuing, um, how can we engage youth in high quality, hands-on STEM in a virtual context? Jose? One of the things that we realized early, and we've been at this for a while, almost a decade, uh, with our STEM education journey back in 2012. But this summer we ramped up a little more to make sure that our mindset was thinking of how do we engage the, the students while they're doing remote learning, but also taking consideration the lack of um, broadband, uh, broadband connectivity, and also what resources uh, do our students have at home? What uh, resources do they not have at home? So thinking through that, we were able to have our, our leadership here in the district allow us to bring teachers in over the course of the summer and we were able at throughout the summer to put different um, task lessons together that actually helped us support students learning remotely which is through our virtual uh, academy or those students that were going to be on track one track two and every school is a little different some schools you know the guidelines and policies out there around social distancing and you know sharing of materials and supplies that was pretty tough to think through that, but every school is a little different and we managed to put a plan in place so that, you know, just to give you an example, at our one of our elementary schools, uh, we've been developing STEM focused lessons, uh, computer science lessons, and then in general, just inquiry lessons, kind of building a repository over the last five years. So we took what we've learned from that and then taking these new variables and we started to see which ones work best and we won't know until this falls over and we see how the students were able to uh, do with the assignments and take home projects and so forth but we were able to put together these lessons that were a combination of some of these projects were take home type projects and like i said they we kept in mind what kind of resources they had at home and in some cases we had to buy and put these kits together and we would send those home as well in the ziploc bags and things like that but we wanted to make sure that skills was at the forefront because at the base of our pyramid for our district, most of our students are heading into the workforce, you know, followed by the next level, which is students going to community college, followed by a four year school. So skills is very important. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose any traction from the work that we've done in the past. Yeah. Well, um, I think uh, for me to answer that properly, I probably need to just give a little background where I, I come from to show you where we're at now. Okay. I, uh, I don't come from a, an educational background. I was in the FBI for 30 years. So when I retired from the FBI, I relocated where I presently am, where I work to motivate youth to look at positive alternatives instead of criminal activity to provide uh, incentives for them, especially uh, the disenfranchised minority, uh, females, Hispanic, um, you know, to expose certain aspects of, of science and technology to them. We decided to focus on aviation, boating, and robotics as intellectual bait Mm -hmm. that we would attract kids with because there's so many aviation uh, facilities in this area, airports and so forth, plus this is a big boating community, plus I was a pilot in the FBI. So we decided to kind of focus on some of those strong points. So that's uh, that was our focus of, of what we did. And we started our organization in uh, June of 2012. So uh, with that being said, our services that we provided have uh, eventually matriculated to summer camp programs, two summer camp programs for middle school age kids, one, one a boating specific program that's three weeks 
and then an aviation specific program that's three weeks for middle school and then a separate two week high school aviation camp. Okay. And this includes the kids actually learning how to sail a sailboat and fly a real aircraft. And we also have a full motion uh, flight simulator and several desktop flight simulators, wind tunnels and all sorts of things that we bought courtesy of our working with the Boris Welcome Foundation uh, fund. And also we have a uh, after school component, which is a 3D vehicle engineering design program. And we were able to obtain land at the uh, Washington airport and uh, in February of 2018, complete construction on our own 6,000 square foot technology health and uh, aviation center. So all of our equipment that we've been uh, able to purchase is now securely located at that uh, facility and all of our after school and summer camp programs are based at that facility augmented with field trips, guest lecturers and so forth coming in to uh, augment our program. Jose is a former educator and I know you're still an educator and the current STEM education director of Green County Schools. What outcomes do you see that arise as a result of the inclusion of STEM in the K-12 curriculum? And how has this specifically impacted girls and minority students within your district? Great question, because I think for us, we hit that, we turned that corner about five years ago, really. Uh, we saw a cultural shift in our students. The biggest thing is the confidence. Our students here, uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, I've been in the district for 19 years, but even our, you know, AIG students, all the way down to our struggling students, they just had this self-confidence issue where they did not think they could meet certain expectations or could build some of the things we're asking them to build. And I think once students started to gain that confidence, it just started to blossom into, you know, each student identifying their strengths. And so when students were able to collaborate uh, and put those skills within their groups and produce some of these products like you know, 3D printed drones, solar powered uh, projects, just a wealth of items. It allowed the students to really blossom and that self-confidence that STEM provided really, you know, propelled the students to do more. And I think one of the other pieces that we noticed in our district as well, which goes into that second part of that question is, you know, here in the district, when I started, we were about 6% um, Latinos. And now we're about 30% Latinos. And so our population is, for students is about 30, 30, a third, a third, and a third. And so with that, I recall the first 10 years in the district, um, didn't see any kind of projects or resemblance of any cultural or specific student interest showing up in their final product. And then with STEM, what we started noticing specifically with our grand challenges of engineering, where we combined the engineering design process and these 14 categories that have been identified that humans or society needs to take on, uh, we started seeing those culture elements kind of come through. Uh, students started selecting different countries from Brazil, Japan, Mexico, and the, that cultural piece started to show up, especially for our females. We noticed that, you know, our females were more engaged. They, they added more details to their projects and they really got into that cultural piece. They loved sharing what was taking place in Germany and why their project would sell, uh, support the uh, German citizens there. Um, but our Latino population, we definitely saw an increase there about three years ago. Typically, you know, what I noticed with the program is that we offer STEM education for all students. Um, and, and then it varies just because we want to make sure that students don't get frustrated with the process and understanding our students' needs. But we noticed that our females were really, our Latino females were really taking on the STEM challenge and really just working hard. And, but we noticed that they just sometimes were not pursuing those post-secondary opportunities. And so what we started to, started to do is we had to go beyond STEM, which is, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and math, but we had to make them understand that STEM is, 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 is more than that. It's, it's also the skills and there's lots of different fields and careers out there. So what we started doing is incorporating careers into the projects where they had to go out and research a specific career that it would take to construct some of these projects or to work on these projects. So then our females and our minority students started to realize that you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be anything, you know, techie or engineering or a math whiz to be able to do this. So it really started impacting our minority and our females because we started to add these other pieces in 
And the reason we got to that point is because we survey our students um, at the 612 level. Um, at the high school, we survey them twice, you know, at the end of each semester and at the middle school level at the end of the year. But we also surveyed our parents. And we also, when we brought it down to the elementary level, we bring in focus groups uh, for kindergarten and so forth. And so really our curriculum has been developed with the guidance of our parents, our teachers, our students. And, and I just guide them to make sure that we include all those pieces. So, you know, it's basically okay. their curriculum. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more from your perspective on, you know, when you think about your work there, but also your work in the FBI, what do you think is the future of STEM um, in K through 12 education and out of school time programs, given what you know and how the world is changing, but also that there are other areas like yours that really may not have those opportunities yet. One reason we changed our name from the Beaufort County Police Activities League, which we were initially known as to the Interbank STEM Center in August of 2018 was to be able to facilitate additional collaborations and partnerships, not only with government agencies, but the private sector and local businesses, because we now put positioning ourselves as a youth pipeline for STEM initiative to help the kids develop soft skills and the 21st century technology skills that they'll need to be uh, competitive em employees. We decided to do this uh, before the high school. So when they get into high school, ninth grade through 12th, they'll already have some type of exposure to some of the technologies and skill sets that they'll be asked to refine when they get into high school and, and choose a career path from the career muster uh, cluster program that North Carolina mm -hmm. offers. So, uh, so we're committed to exposing the kids to the soft skills, the professionals from different uh, career paths, and also a lot of hands-on project-oriented uh, uh, projects that we do in our building to get the kids thinking about uh, a healthy uh, lifestyle, a clean background so they can pass background checks, and the STEM exposure, because we focus on a holistic approach, the whole person concept, not just the, uh, the STEM aspect, because from my experience in the FBI, you can be a very smart person, but if you don't have the right morality, to not join a hate group, to not help someone build a bomb or whatever, you, you will be lured into negative peer pressure. So we felt that that was a very important ingredient to complement the science and technology exposure we're trying to, to, uh, to get the kids. So, uh, so hence, that, that is the only way these kids are gonna make it and get out of their socioeconomic uh, situation. And we focus on education, not violence or criminal activity, being the way to a better lifestyle, a quality of life, and also both the counties, like so many more rural counties in North Carolina, has a program, has a problem with the folks leaving the area when they graduate from high school. Uh, that mm -hmm. impacts on workforce development. So we figure that through the combination of after school programming and the summer camp programming and working very closely with local industry and government, we can encourage the kids to stay in school, identify an aptitude that marries up with a, uh, a career track and a professional uh, area, get the training they need, and then businesses can be attracted to locate in Beaufort County and other rural eastern North Carolina counties and help perpetuate the future and allow the kids to stay here and the kids not relocate. Well, thank you so much, Jose and Al. It has been wonderful to have you here today. And after the break, we'll be joined by a student in one of North Carolina's after-school programs and also a current research researcher who will share her path with you. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Joining us now are Itavia Curry Chisholm and Francis Godoy. Francis is a youth participant of the Sipnayan Math Center and After School Program. Itavia is currently a research technician at Duke University in the Sarantopolis Lab. As a child, she participated in programs that sparked her interest in STEM. Itavia, you've been engaged in STEM programs, and Francis, you're currently in a STEM program. What does STEM mean to both of you? Itavia? Um, STEM to me means uh, imagination, creativity within the bounds of science, technology, engineering, and math, of course, um, and being able to be hands-on with what my ideas could be. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Francis, how about you? STEM to me is a preparation for our gener my generation in the future for their jobs and stock market because um, 
STEM is high demand and you invest in it. So Francis, what do you love about your program? Yeah, the things we do in STEM, like frog dissection, we, um, we made ice cream, <laughs> and we did a balloon tower. <laughs> so you like the challenges. Yeah. <laughs> so Francis, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you know? I want to be a NASA scientist that engineers rockets because it involves STEM. Excellent. Do you think your program has helped you both know what you want to be, but also you also helped you develop those STEM skills? Yes, um, I think the challenges we did in um, STEM in our after school helped me because, well, we're going to have more projects like egg drop challenge in a, a lift tower. So I think that's going to help me um, with engineering and the science um, for my job. Excellent. So you do like the challenges. That's great. Um, Itavia, now I'd love to turn to you for a moment. And I know you're currently a research technician at Duke. And what does that role entail? And what do you love about your work? Um, I love, um, what I most love about my work is being able to go in and continue to work on a problem. Um, just kind of tinker my experiments to tailor the questions that I'm asking and getting the chance to ask these really um, deep kind of mechanistic type questions within my work. So a typical day for me uh, would be going into the lab um, and what may seem like a really small thing but it's a really big thing to me is going in and saying hey to everybody and kind of ask them how they're doing and what they're working on just so I can get my mind uh, back on track and focused on my task and everything for the day is going to be. Um, and that could be printing off a new protocol for me to try on my cells, maybe optimizing a protocol for future experiments, maybe sitting down and doing data analysis and seeing what new discoveries I've made in the past weeks or so. Um, and so my days are ever changing, but always worth it, always worth it. And I can see you Francis, have that curiosity and loving challenges in common already. So that's- <laughs> Yes, it will take you far. Yes. So as an African-American woman, Itavia, what role did representation play for you as it pertains to your STEM aspirations? Representation played a huge role for me. And one of my first like after school programs, Delta Gems, I was able to meet an African-American woman who was a doctor, which was outside of anything that anyone in my family had ever done before. So I was like, oh, this is something that I could pursue. Um, and so when I went to North Carolina Central University and I came across some of my first African American female biology professors, um, chemistry professors, I was even more um, entrenched in the idea that yes, STEM is somewhere I can see myself excel. I know that I could do well, but having those people there to show me that people who look like me could prosper in those realms was really important, tremendously important. Excellent. And Francis, I wonder what advice you have for other students who are curious, but maybe haven't had all these opportunities that you've had. What advice would you give them in school, but also out of school? Like you can um, search up how to do it and the things you have at home. And if you want to do a specific thing, then you can do it at home and get supplies. But if you don't have supplies, you can do it your own way. Mm -hmm. And Itavia, what advice would you give to educators, program providers, business and funders regarding the need for continued STEM investments and youth engagement in high quality STEM? Um, I would say to teachers, not to count out the students that seem um, easy to overlook, um, program providers, seeking out these students where they are, kind of meeting them where they are in their communities um, and being more open to what their demographic or target audience is. And then um, to funders to find these programs and these educators who are making the efforts to do these things and giving them the resources that they need to continue making a significant impact. Do you have any advice for um, students, you know, children in middle or high school, if they kind of wonder about STEM, but they're just not sure or they had gone down that, you know, maybe used to be interested in it, but have kind of lost their interest. Do you have any advice for them? Um, my major advice for them would be to be open to new experiences. STEM is not a one-lane street. There's so many different things that you can do. 
I'm over here trying to be like a life scientist and Francis is talking about being a rocket engineer. There is just so many different avenues that they can take advantage of. So if there is anything um, like remotely STEM that they find cool, if it's looking at a human body, if it's dissection like Francis is doing, if it's um, even putting together car engines or anything like that, I encourage them to kind of continue seeking those things out, whether it be through YouTube, whether it be going on to um, NC STEM center.org I believe is the um, website or .com and they can find programs in their areas of interest. So yes, definitely just mm -hmm. taking the initiative to learn more about it themselves and find programs in the area that can help them learn more. You have both definitely inspired us today and also made me even more curious. So we're so grateful for you sharing your story and helping others think about how they can pursue these areas. After the break, the final word. Because of the age of my own children, with two in college and one in high school, I have the opportunity to hear firsthand, or at least hear about, what students are planning to do after their formal education. It has amazed me recently to appreciate how many students have a sense of what they want to do in their careers, whether to be a computer programmer, a journalist, a dentist, or an engineer. When I dig deeper, however, I quickly realize that these students who know what they want to do have something in common. They were all exposed to the possibility of their fields early. They had a chance to understand what a job might be through many different avenues. They had the opportunity to know enough to pursue classes that relate to that field and the confidence to say that they want to be an energy conservationist, a statistician, a scientist, or a neurologist. However, many of our students do not necessarily have these opportunities to explore or even learn about a range of potential careers. Within the top 10 jobs across the nation, half are in the STEM field. If changes and investments are not made, we will not have the workforce we need for those jobs and will ultimately fail our children and our economy. Jobs in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM fields, power our economy and build shared prosperity among our society. Investing in after school and summer STEM learning programs will help students explore their interests, build skills, connect with mentors, and prepare for jobs in growing fields like healthcare, information technology, and cybersecurity. Kids are exposed to STEM through in and out of school programs. For some students, an in-school curriculum gives them the ability to identify or continue to develop their interest. For others, after-school programs give needed hands-on creativity and experience to be able to explore the field and creative spark of interest. After school programs also provide a safe space for students to try out ideas and figure out their interest. Each student learns differently and ensuring that they have multiple and unique ways in and out of school to create passion surrounding STEM is paramount. Some of us can remember the moment that we knew what we wanted to do. For others, it was a much slower path to discovery. Regardless, we needed access to the possibilities to what it could mean to truly dedicate our energy to pursuing a certain field. Kids are the same way. They're capable of much more than we often give them the chance to share. By creating meaningful and sustained access to STEM and STEM programs, students have a chance to understand why this is relevant to them and to build key skills that provide excellent pathways and critical contribution to today's economy. In North Carolina, we have the human resources, the local industries, and the financial means to work together to create pathways for students to understand more about STEM fields and to translate that knowledge into careers. We must commit ourselves to making these pathways a reality for our students and families and for North Carolina. Thank you so much for thinking about and learning about education. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.